next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Gary Coyne. Uh, he was a former director of the Center for Austrian Studies here at the University of Minnesota. His area of expertise is uh, 19th century Central European history, and he serves as a professor of history at the Department of History at the University of Minnesota. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. It's a privilege uh, to join in this panel. Uh, I want to offer some historical perspectives on anti-Semitism. I think um, I will touch on some of the points that Philip Spencer made that perhaps complement uh, his thoughts and push in some other directions. And I'll hear some echoes of Chad Goldberg's thoughts about um, the peculiarities of the phenomenon of anti-Semitism in modern societies. Uh, this panel takes a long view of anti-Semitism in modern societies, asking what long-term historical continuities there may be and what represents new departures. From the perspective of historical writing on anti-Semitism, it is always very tempting to look at the hatred of Jews and Judaism as a long-persisting social phenomenon appearing perhaps in different forms in various times and places, but still partaking of common long-term elements and always carrying forward certain long-term memories which unite all the particular anti-Semitic manifestations. A prominent historian at the Hebrew University, Robert Wistrich, for example, has dedicated much of the latest phase of his long scholarly career to writing and lecturing on anti-Semitism as such a long-term social and political phenomenon with a continuous history and common threads from ancient times to the present. His book, Anti-Semitism, The Longest Hatred, published in North America in 1992, presents that vision. And that book accompanied a three-part television documentary which aired on PBS that year. And I suspect there are at least a few members of the uh, audience old enough to remember the 1992 screenings. Uh, the continuities can indeed be interesting, whether they are the oft-repeated hate rhetoric about Jews as supposed price killers, or as supposed economic exploiters, or as supposedly uncreative, unproductive, unproductive parasitic elements who inhabit the margins of society. One can also think of the accusations of Jews committing ritual murder, which have turned up in widely separated times and places. And what should remember here, that in that part of the world that I study and teach about, ritual murder charges went to trial in Hungary, in Germany, in Bohemia, and in Russia, as recently as the era between the early 1880s and 1914. Even noting these continuities, let me as an historian argue, and this is my first conceptual point here, that to understand how anti-Semitism has worked as a social and political phenomenon, and to provide at least one explanation for its remarkable persistence over many centuries, it is best to think about how its form, its social function and purposes, its political uses, its social carriers, and even parts of the core ideational content have changed significantly over time. Even while we allow for the presence of recurring rhetorical tropes and cultural elements and the important role of memories of prior episodes and eras. There's an old distinction in scholarly and scientific thinking that Charles Darwin drew as far back as 1857 between lumpers and splitters. That is between those who like to draw together a range of seemingly distinct but similar manifestations into a single overarching phenomenon, and those others who find greater value in keeping the finer distinctions sharp so that differences in particular instances and circumstances remain clear. Like many, but not all historians, I'm much more comfortable intellectually in being a splitter, and in making splitters arguments uh, than in lumping phenomena together. Now, if we look at the long era, the long history of anti-Semitism in Western societies with an eye for the differences in social and political context and purposes, I think we understand better why and how it has found promote proponents and functions so prominently as a factor in society and politics in such widely different times and places. And that it works better, I think, than if one sees it as having strong basic similarities throughout history. The same cultural images and tropes which appear again and again over centuries, and the memories and monuments to previous episodes 
may help provide some foundations for the new manifestations and often help make it easy to target Jews. Uh, uh, but I believe that anti-Semitic voices and movements in each particular time and place have had their own interests, purposes, and bases of support. If we look at the relationship of Jews to Christian society in broad terms from the end of the Roman Empire uh, through the late Middle Ages, and I'm not going to do this in detail, don't worry, uh, we find anti-Semitic feeling and action arising first on religious grounds and then increasingly having an economic basis. Christian claims to religious superiority and primacy, and a special love-hate relationship between Christianity and the religion from which it ori originated, led to restricted measures against Jews already during late antiquity. In many places, Jews were forbidden to own non-Jewish slaves, forbidden to proselytize, and forbidden to intermarry with non-Jews. Religiously inspired mob attacks on Jews occurred periodically, particularly during the Lenten season and around Easter and such violence continued throughout the Middle Ages. Already in late antiquity, uh, there were waves of official persecution of Jews, particularly in the 7th century in the Byzantine Empire, in Spain, Burgundy, and Lombardy. Legal restrictions and changes in the European economy after the early Middle Ages also tended to push Jews off the land and increase steadily their concentration in commercial activities, helping establish an occupational pattern that lasted for centuries. The concentration of Jews in commerce and various middleman functions, often including the least desirable occupations, in turn sparked mistrust and economic resentments against Jews. So to the existing religious grounds for discrimination, then were added economic reasons for friction and hatred. Formerly, the medieval Catholic Church rejected mass violence against Jews, but the Church did work to segregate and humiliate Jews. In the Middle Ages, Jews were expelled from many, ter from many territories, from England in 1290, from much of France in 1306, and as most famous, no, no, but most widely, from Spain in 1492 at the conclusion of the Reconquista. The Church ultimately determined that in those territories where Jews were still tolerated, they should be kept in an immiserated, subaltered status as a living reminder of the fate of those who rejected the gospel. The practice of confining Jews' habitation to segregated ghettos developed over the period, a long period of development, from the 13th century to the 16th century. Those circumstances of the ghetto life persisted in most of the Western and Central European territories where Jews were tolerated until the era of the French Revolution and even middle of the 19th century in many of the German states and the Habsburg monarchy. Anti-Semitism based in religious prejudice and economic resentments persisted as a matter of current belief and active practice in many Christian societies through the 19th century and even into the early 20th century in some of those societies as well. Most obviously in Eastern Europe where there were significant Jewish minorities who were culturally unassimilated and still had very distinct occupational profiles into the early 20th century. Elsewhere, the memories of religious and economic anti-Semitism remain part of popular lore, part of the popular cultural heritage, which could be picked up for symbolic or metaphoric use uh, for new political purposes in new modern social circumstances. The 19th century, after all, saw enormous changes in economic, social, and legal structures. And there's a tip off to the kind of history I do. Those changes, the advent of free market agriculture and manufacturing, shook up traditional villages and towns, and economic development together with liberal legal reforms opened new social opportunities and possibilities for mobility for Jews and Christians alike in Europe and the Atlantic world. And there's a bit of Durkheim's development and anarchy coming through again. Reformers expected legal emancipation of the Jews, their movement into new occupations, and the increase in secular schooling and advanced secular education for Jews to make them more like the Christian citizenry than ever before. You wouldn't have to resent Jews from being so different because emancipation liberalization of the laws will make them more like everybody else. And as a byproduct, that ought to end prejudice against Jews. But the new wave of anti-Semitic ideology and political action 
that was taken up by populist mass-based political movements in Europe after the late 1870s was not at all what liberal reformers expected as a reaction or consequence to the liberal reforms. The popular radical anti-Semitism of the 19th and early 20th centuries was in fact a new political and eventually racial anti-Semitism. The product of modern dislocation, economic despair, mass political mobilization, and the development of ideologies of social salvation for the losers in the modernization processes based on simple sounding remedies. And I know that's a mouthful, but that's what's going on. Let me offer here two more related conceptual points about the modern history of anti-Semitism, drawn from some wide observations which Hannah Arendt first made more than 50 years ago in the section of her origins of totalitarianism devoted to anti-Semitism. And I too find much rich, is rich conceptually in that older work, even though Professor Arendt had a way of getting a lot of her historical facts wrong. Uh, the first conceptual point here is that we cannot properly understand anti-Semitism and its recurrence over many centuries as some sort of eternal scapegoating of Jews. Oh, it's the same old scapegoating. I think we've all heard that kind of, seen the shrug and heard that argument. The old religious and economic anti-Semitism found real targets in Jews' religious differences from Christians and Jews' distinct economic roles and distinct occupational profiles. Jews and Judaism were not some randomly chosen victims. The second related conceptual point here is that Jews and Judaism were a chosen target both for the traditional or religious or economic anti-Semitism and for the modern political or racial anti-Semitism for reasons specific to Jews. It's not that Jews were guilty of what they're accused of, but there were reasons that, uh, for, uh, in the new anti-Semitism that connected to Jews' experience. Again, the targeting of Jews was not simply arbitrary. Let me explain. Modern radical anti-Semitism, first of all, took advantage of the old traditions of religious and economic anti-Semitism, and of the economic and cultural frictions and resentments which arose from the growth of large, new Jewish immigrant communities in the big cities of Western and Central Europe and throughout the Atlantic world. Still, radical anti-Semitism went far beyond the realities of Jews' existence, values, and activities in contemporary societies in the wild claims about the evils which Jews and Judaism had supposedly caused in the modern world and what benefits would come from adopting harsh new discriminatory measures or excluding them from society altogether. Jews now became a target in continental Europe because they could easily be made to symbolize all the disruptive changes of capitalist, commercial, and industrial development and liberal constitutional reform, which shook up traditional villages and towns and created challenges for be it small farmers, independent craftsmen, small shopkeepers, wage laborers, and later white collar employees. Remember that in the short period between the 1840s and the 1870s, Liberal reforms allowed Jews to leave the miserable life of small central European ghettos and the East European Jewish towns to become equal citizens in much of Western and Central Europe, to gain advanced secular education, and to begin to enter a range of new, more respectable occupations. Jews were thus among the most obvious, but still culturally distinct, beneficiaries of liberal reforms and economic modernization in Europe. The political activists in the nationalist radical right in Austria and Germany and France and later in Russia who criticized modernization and promised to restore welfare and social harmony for the true members of their nations are found in Jews and sometimes also other newly upwardly mobile or immigrant social elements, easy human symbols for all the changes uh, yeah, that these people rejected, and easy targets against which to rally support for radical corrective action. Despite all their extravagant rhetoric, the radical anti-Semitic political movements of the 1890s, however, were still a long way from the industrialized genocide of the Nazi death camps, which were unthinkable before 1900. However, with the enormous growth in the authority of the 20th century state, with the advance of its powers and its willingness to engage in sweeping measures of social re-engineering, such as ethnic cleansing and genocide, and with the experience in World War I 
of the state-sanctioned use of organized violent force on a massive scale, what was previously unthinkable now became conceivable. And it's no accident that early in, in the middle of Hitler's thinking as he's uh, then chancellor uh, about uh, Jewish policy, he talks about the Armenian genocide and claiming that who remembers now uh, the Armenian this is something that the 20th century state could imagine and create that was unimaginable, even among the most radical anti-Semites before 1990. Even the historian Helmut Balser Smith, who wants to see long-term continuities in German history and traditions of anti-Semitic violence and exclusion, has to grant that there was a fundamental shift in means and ends for anti-Semitic policies between 1900 and the late 1930s. Even then, however, the Nazis never dared state publicly in explicit terms that they would undertake the systematic murder of millions of people before they actually began to do it after the start of World War II. Nor did they even announce this as a goal of their policies after they actually started to do it. The 19th century saw enormous changes in social uh, progress. When we look at anti-Semitism since World War II, we find a great variety of phenomena which draw on selected elements of the older beliefs, modes of political action, rhetoric, and purposes. Following my own analytic instincts as a splitter, I recommend that we be sensitive to varieties of discourse, to the varieties of discourse of political action, goals, basis of support, alliances, and larger political and or social functions demonstrated by each anti-Semitic group or episode. In many European countries today, such as Poland, Romania, or Germany, anti-Semitic rhetoric or action draws on rich native anti-Semitic heritage, but has little or nothing to do with the actual status and roles of Jews in those societies today, or, I should say more properly, their absence in the cases of Poland and Romania. And it has much more to do with making particular kinds of political statements and rallying certain kinds of support in society. Anti-Semitism without Jews has had a rich history in a number of European countries since World War II, after all. And the former communist governments in Poland and Czechoslovakia, for example, used it a number of times in periods of difficulty or crisis as a diversionary tactic. The Hungarian communist soldiers, I think, had a harder time actually using it overtly. We can talk about that later. In a number of countries, such as France, for instance, many who engage today in anti-Semitic rhetoric and attacks on Jewish institutions and individual Jews use a generalized anti-Semitism interchangeably with hostility to Israel and Zionism, or sometimes as a proxy for their anti-Semitism, or in some cases anti-Zionism as a proxy for their anti-Semitism. And, and that's something that's been mentioned already by Philip that we should discuss some further. This, however, was already the case in the old communist bloc in the 1970s and 80s, long before it became fashionable in various segments of West European political life. Anti-Semitism is still very much with us today, and it draws on many historical tropes, but it continues to have a remarkably protean character as it develops and is used in distinct circumstances for distinct purposes. Thank you.